So let me get this straight. One week ago, NASCAR handed out penalties for cutting a corner by one inch, but tonight they wouldn't even review the race deciding restart? Make it make sense. How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. Oh gosh, this, my cheeks are getting sore. Ugh, oh, no, I just can't do it anymore. I was trying to fake a smile, but the truth is I'm pissed off. Very disappointed with the way NASCAR officiated tonight's race. And I'm not just talking about the final restart. I haven't seen the SMT data. Fox refused to show us telemetry. So I don't know for sure if Denny Hamlin jumped the restart, although the replays make it seem pretty clear that he did. I'm talking about the whole race. NASCAR ruined this race with a single call they made in the middle of stage two. We will get to that in just a few moments. First and foremost, I do wanna say happy Easter. This smile is genuine, okay? It is is a very happy weekend. Happy Easter to all of you who celebrate. <sighs> okay, now we do have to talk about this race. We will take a look at the top finishers, break down some of the key storylines, analyze some interesting trends. We'll get to that in just a few moments. I think reporter Jeff Gluck on X earlier tonight said it best. Richmond Raceway's only selling point is strategy racing. It's not like Bristol or Martinsville doesn't feature the same bumper to bumper beating and banging short track action. It's an old abrasive worn out surface that eats tires, allows for teams to decide one stop or two stops in the stages. How do we want to break up these runs? Leads to a lot of comers and goers, a lot of movement throughout the field. For the past several years especially, that has been Richmond Raceway. It's a strategy track. The first half of tonight's race delivered some good strategy racing, especially in stage two, 160 laps. Most of the leaders opted to break that run up into thirds, but a select few opted to split that run basically in half, make just one stop in the middle. Among those drivers were Kyle Larson, the pole sitter, Bubba Wallace, Alex Bowman, who both ran top five in the opening stint, and Todd Gilland, the best qualifying Ford, and spent nearly the entire first half of the race inside the top 10. Those four drivers tried a differential strategy. Things were shaping up to be very interesting in the final laps of stage two when NASCAR chose to throw an unbelievable caution. Kyle Busch went wide, got into the outside wall a little bit. I'm not even sure he lost a position, quite honestly, yet NASCAR quickly threw the trigger. Mere milliseconds after that eight car scraped the wall, the yellow lights were flashing. NASCAR was ready. They'd seen enough of this long green flag run with spread out race cars. They wanted themselves a restart. The moment Kyle Busch got a smidgen out of the groove, race control was on that button like it was, I don't know, Jeopardy. Jeopardy, right? They pushed the, yeah. You push the button fast. The timing of that caution ruined Kyle Larson, Bubba Wallace, Alex Bowman, and Todd Gill in strategy. Now Larson, fast car, had also driven his way up to sixth place at the time. He was able to recover, didn't lose much track position, but Bubba Wallace went from running inside the top five, top three, to 15th. Alex Bowman, who granted did have a slightly slower stop, went from being a top five car to a lap down, trapped as a result of this ill-timed, and I believe ill-advised, caution. Todd Gilliland, a great story that opening stage, wasn't mentioned again all night. Every crew chief on pit road saw NASCAR with the quick trigger and said, nope, we are not trying that one-stop strategy. Stage three, sure enough, every single driver opted to go with a two-stop strategy. So suddenly, the intriguing Richmond Raceway strategy racing we've come to know was no more. Ruined by NASCAR's poor officiating decision in the middle of stage two. Yes, that Kyle Busch caution call not only ruined Alex Bowman, Bubba Wallace, Todd Gillen's nights, it also ruined stage three and ruined the only selling point Richmond Raceway has. This was not a banner night for NASCAR race control. That brings me to the final overtime restart. Let's just take a look at the replay. There's no telemetry shown here, but you can clearly see Denny Hamlin in the 11 go just before he gets to that first white line. He is the leader of the race, but he's not allowed to restart the race until he hits that first white line. Again, because Fox didn't show us any telemetry, because I don't have access to SMT data, I don't know for sure if Hamlin jumped the restart, but visually, it looks like he went just before the white line. The restart should have at the very least been reviewed. Fox reported after the checkered flag that the restart was never under review. Another call that I believe NASCAR race control got wrong. And much like the Kyle Busch caution in the middle of stage two, this call ruined this race even further. 
The first call ruined Richmond Raceway strategy. This second call ruined the finish in my eyes. I joked about this at the top of the show, but one week ago, NASCAR scrutinized every corner at Circuit of the Americas. In the S's, if you were an inch out of line, a pass-through penalty was issued, which ruined driver's days. NASCAR handed out 37 of those on Saturday alone. I understand that it's overtime, it's the final restart of the race, you don't want a penalty to loom over your finish, but that doesn't change the fact that the restart should have been reviewed. I know some will say that, hey, well, Martin Truex Jr. was still able to get to Hamlin's door in turns one and two. That's besides the point. If you jump the restart, you jump the restart. The 11 car, in my eyes, should have been under penalty. He should not have been declared the winner of this race, at least not without some sort of official review. Again, Fox never showed us telemetry, but NASCAR absolutely has access to every square inch of these cars in this racetrack. They have the data. They could have reviewed it. They chose not to. I don't understand why. Again, last week, they handed out 37 ticky-tack cutting the course penalties. They wouldn't even review the finish. It sucks. It really, really stinks. Hey, future me here. I did want to mention that Elton Sawyer, NASCAR VP of competition, told reporters after the race that NASCAR did review the restart, said it was close, but they didn't feel Hamlin jumped it. Fox Sports on the broadcast said that the restart was never under official review. So that's the information I've been going off here on this rant. I don't know if you know, Elton Sawyer just means that you know, NASCAR watched the restart live and we're like, oh, it wasn't close enough to review. It still doesn't sound like the booth ever officially reviewed the restart uh, during the race or just after the race. That part's just me speculating, but I, you know, Fox said they didn't review it. Uh, so you know, Fox obviously doesn't get everything right, but that's what I was going off in this rant. But just wanted to mention that. I had to vent to start the show. I had to get that off my chest. Now, we are going to take a look at the top finishers. I'm not going to put an asterisk next to Denny Hamlin's name or anything like that. He did have a great race. His pit crew put him in position to take advantage at the end. He was aggressive on the final restart, put it in NASCAR's hands, and they opted not to make the call. I can't fault Denny Hamlin for that. He knows the game. He knows NASCAR doesn't want to make that call. Denny Hamlin gets the win, his second points-paying win of the season, second win in three weeks, second short track win. In fact, Denny Hamlin has won every short track race of the season, even if you include the clash at the Coliseum. He started tonight slow. I even pointed out on social media that Hamlin early on was running 16th, didn't seem to be moving forward. I thought that was peculiar to say the least, but they were able to work on their car throughout the night, drove into the top 10, got stage points, drove into the top five. Eventually, the pit crew was able to put them over the top. I don't want to take away from Denny Hamlin's pit crew. And to be fair, Denny Hamlin gave immediate credit to his team. An 8.9 to 9.0 second pit stop there at the end. I've seen a few mixed reports out there on social media. A very freaking fast pit stop got Hamlin the lead over Truex and Logano. Fox, I think, showed Truex and Logano's pit stops at like 10.3 seconds for both of them. So Hamlin's pit stop was at least a full second faster than the two guys in front of him. That was the difference between him getting the lead and not. So credit to Denny Hamlin's pit crew. Joey Logano finishes second. Tremendous night for Logano. He has been so up and down, so inconsistent to start the year. Tonight he finishes second, collected 14 points in the stages. He entered this race 22nd in the standings. Certainly going to make up some spots now. Great night for Logano considering his Penske teammates Blaney and Cindric were terrible. I know Blaney has Historically, he's not been very good at Richmond. I guess that showed tonight, but gosh, it was jarring to see Logano top five and Blaney 27th for much of the night. Like that sort of disparity between two championship caliber teammates rarely happens in this sport. Logano was on his game tonight. Kyle Larson earned a stage win, was very fast tonight. Another top five finish for him. That's extremely encouraging. Martin Truex Jr. finished fourth. He was the dominant driver tonight. He led more than half the laps. He won a stage. He all but had this race locked up until the caution flag flew with a lap and a half to go. And let's talk about that caution with a lap and a half to go because this also ties back into Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson gets loose, slows down suddenly on corner exit. Bubba's trying to get in line right behind him. When Larson slows, no chance for Bubba to react. Larson spins. Not Bubba's fault, just a racing deal. But Larson was so far ahead of other drivers for position that despite spinning out, he was able to kind of save it, keep it rolling. 
he lost only like one spot, maybe two spots on track, was able to come down pit road still in like fourth or fifth place, came off pit road in fourth. So despite being the caution, spinning out, Larson, I think, gained a spot in the running order or at the very least broke even. Bubba Wallace, ironically, then had an issue on his pit stop. So he lost a bunch of track position as a result of this caution. Just crazy how things like that work. But back to Martin Truex Jr. now, that caution cost him the win, most likely. The pit crew got beat by Denny Hamlin's, fair enough. But there wasn't much Truex could do on the restart. Again, Hamlin, in my eyes, jumped it a tad early. Hamlin also maybe ran Truex a little wide between one and two. Truex said afterwards that Hamlin used him up. Larson, who had a front row seat for this, also said that Hamlin used him up. <laughs> Not much Truex could do. Honestly, I felt bad for him. I know Truex threw a bit of a temper tantrum there during the cool down lap. Not sure all those antics were exactly justified, but he did compose himself by the time he got out of the car. This was a brutal loss for Martin Truex Jr. Dominant car, led the most laps, was cruising to the victory, his first win in months. Remember, it was just a couple weeks ago, he snapped like a streak of 17 straight races without a top five. It's been a while since midnight Martin Truex Jr. got to victory lane. He looked destined to win his fourth Richmond night race, but it wasn't meant to be. Bad timing on the caution, not a bad pit stop from his crew, just not a great one. Got beat by Hamlin. And then wrong end of a wacky, screwy restart. I'm not putting an asterisk up there. You can't make me. Fourth place for Martin Truex Jr. though continues a very strong start to the season. He's got, I think, six top tens in the first seven races. Strong finish for Chase Elliott, top five. Good night for Hendrick Motorsports. You get two cars there in the top five. William Byron gets a top 10, though he had a very quiet evening, I'd say. Not pictured as Alex Bowman. He finishes 17th. Again, he was trapped a lap down by that untimely caution. He was able to take the wave around, but then lost the lap again because he was on old tires. Got the free pass and was able to pass his way back up to 17th, you know, did not get the finish I felt he deserved, but Hendrick Motorsports continues to look pretty good, and it's nice seeing Chase Elliott up in the top five, Alex Bowman qualified in the top five, we talked a lot about the, the five and the 24 the last year and a half, but now the nine and the 48 seem to have closed that gap a bit, good to see. Christopher Bell finishes sixth, I thought he had a shot at the win tonight, was looking really strong early in stage three, they tried a slightly different pitch strategy in stage three, but Bell sped on pit road screwed that all up. The fact that they recovered to finish sixth, quite impressive. Tells you the kind of long run speed that 20 car had once again. Couple of top tens for RFK. They're just continuing to lurk. They don't have winning speed right now, it seems, but they're, they're good. They're still very solid. Haven't lost much of what they had last season. Last guy I want to mention here is Josh Berry, finishing 11th. Drove his way up into the top five. He was the show the first half of this race. Qualified outside the top 30, but the short track superstar worked his way through the field past most of those cars on the racetrack. Remember that first pit stop was an, a non-competitive pit stop, so they weren't making up a bunch of spots on pit road or with strategy. Josh Berry was just passing guys. Wet tires, slick tires did not matter. Josh Berry was moving to the front in the opening stint. Really impressive stuff. He did lose a few spots on a restart, I think to start stage three, right around the midway portion of this race. He was running seventh, couldn't really go forward at that point. I think other cars had probably gotten better. Barry ends up 11th, still a very promising showing from uh, Josh Barry, Rodney Childers, and that whole bunch. Really all of Stuart Haas. I know they don't get anyone in the top 10, unfortunately, but they had cars in and around the top 10 for much of the evening. That's something to, to build on. I'll be listening to Stacking Pennies this week to figure out what went wrong with Corey. LaJoy. Uh, they fired off with 36th place speed. They ran 36th all night and finished 36th dead last. Uh, that's what Spire of three years ago, four years ago might have done. That's not what Spire of 2024 should be doing. And his teammate Zane Smith finished one spot better in 35th. Really rough night for Spire. I don't know what happened. Hopefully we find out. I'm sure someone can let me know in the comments what went wrong. <laughs> Those were some of your top finishers. Now, I do want to end on kind of a positive note, at least until we get to the groovy gauge. NASCAR and Goodyear both deserve a round of applause for their work on wet weather tires over the past few years. They debuted at road courses a few years ago now. We've now seen them a couple times at short ovals and wherever they've gone, wherever they've been used, I think they've been extremely successful. Despite substantial rain this afternoon and early evening, tonight's race 
only was delayed maybe 15 minutes. They were able to get this race started very close to the original advertised start time which two years ago would not have been possible. Two years ago, this race would have started probably an hour late, which, you know, for TV, that's tough. For fans there in attendance, that's tough. A much shorter delay tonight. Yes, I know they ran a few extra, you know, caution laps in the middle of stage one, was kind of sluggish. Yes, they had to do non-competitive pit stops for safety reasons. Maybe that's questionable. But overall, I think wet weather tires have been a huge success and both NASCAR and Goodyear should be proud. Honestly, the success of these wet weather tires the past few years has me wondering why we didn't do this 20 years ago. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, they worked at North Wilkesboro last summer. Tonight, they worked at Richmond. I mean, these things are very impressive. That is one compliment I'd like to give NASCAR tonight, but I don't know, the compliments stop there. Let's put this race on the Groovy Gauge. This year, the Groovy Gauge is sponsored by Electric E-Bikes. If you're looking for a new electric bike, head to electricebikes.com or you can click the link down in the description below. <sighs> Even if I ignore the questionable officiating decisions tonight, this wasn't a great race. New short track package maybe allowed for some extra passing. I mean, like I said, Josh Berry made a lot of passes early on. Late in this race, Christopher Bell was able to move through the top five, make some noise. But as has become typical with the next gen car and short tracks, it was difficult to pass. It was hard to pass lapped cars. I've noticed over the past few weeks, uh, public opinion on parody has kind of changed. I remember two years ago, the first year of the next gen, everybody loved parody. Gosh, a new winner almost every week. It was fantastic. It was universally praised and adored. That's changed recently because I think everyone's finally realized that parody with the next gen car really just means everyone's equal to the point that it's extremely hard to pass because from first to 36th place, there's not a ton of lap time differential. Dire fall off is pretty similar. So yes, while the field is equal, more guys have a shot at winning. These races have also become track position races, especially at a place like Richmond that was always kind of hard to pass at, but especially now in this new car, it's very difficult to make moves and gain track position over the course of a long green flag run. There's a good stretch towards the end of this race where first through fourth were separated by a second, a second and a half. That looks great on TV. They're oh so close, but no one was making moves. Nobody was close enough to actually pass. Great parody, four guys, different manufacturers, different teams, all with a chance to win, but the actual competition, the action, not exciting. I've noticed people have sort of caught on to that over the past few weeks. And again, the public opinion has changed. Parody was like a great compliment a, a year ago. And now it's almost, and I won't say it's a dirty word, but it doesn't have quite the same glowing reception it used to. Anyway, tonight's race was probably average without the terrible officiating decisions. But again, the bad caution call in the middle of stage two ruined this race's strategy down the stretch. And the bad no call on the final restart to me, makes the winner of this race at least a little questionable. That all but ruins this race for me. I don't know what my all-time low groovy gauge score is, but this is going to come damn near close to it. 25%. That's my groovy gauge score for tonight's Toyota Owners 400 at Richmond Raceway. It pains me to say it. I like strategy races, but this race didn't come down to strategy. I love late race restarts. This one was kind of screwy. I'm shaking my head. It's a bummer. I love this sport. We see in other sports all the time. Bad calls can decide games late, but that doesn't mean it hurts any less. So 25% for me it stinks, but it is what it is. Let me know if you agree or disagree with my score. Am I being too hard on this race? Do you see those officiating calls differently? I mean, be honest with me. Everyone has different opinions. I'd be curious to know what you think. Leave a comment down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Let's try to get some positivity going here tonight. Subscribe if you're new to the channel and you love NASCAR. I react to races every week. We talk about the latest news and rumors during the week. The content never stops here at Out of the Groove. And thank you to my Patreon supporters for your continued support. I do want to say thank you to uh, everyone who has sent congratulatory messages on uh, Twitter or Instagram or other social media platforms uh, made kind of a personal announcement over there. This was a really happy weekend for me. It's a shame <laughs> this race kind of had to ruin my Sunday night. Um, but no, I do really appreciate uh, all the comments, the messages. It really means a lot. It really does. I appreciate you guys. We both do, I should say, even though you know she's not usually on camera here to, to say it herself. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I will see you again tomorrow. Have a good rest of your weekend. Happy Easter.